This is Critical Nonsense, our high lowbrow show about culture, science, and tech. This week, Joey and I talk about everyday and existential comfort zones. This is the sound of your brain on Joey. This is what a Joey sounds like. And this is what an executive producer and hypothetical potential could be aspiring psychonaut Jess Vander sounds like. Well, hi, this is Jess. I don't know what that means. And yet again, we are faced with the moment where I don't know what that means. Joey? We're at yes, yes, no. Um, maybe we'll, maybe we'll cover it after. Oh, okay. Sounds good. Uh, housekeeping. Rate, review, subscribe, tell a friend. We are apparently had a brief stint as the number one podcast in Liberia. Wow. Thank you very much. You're Didn't welcome. Didn't expect that. According to, to all whom? of our Liberian listeners, thank you for listening. Um, to, I think, like, podcharts.com or chartable. Podcharts.com. Like one, one of those. Accreditation, of those. accreditation. <laughs> Woohoo! Big, uh, no big numbers. Deal. We are also, <laughs> I believe, the 179th philosophy podcast in the netherlands so uh, thank you very much <laughs> look uh. out world we're <laughs> coming through yeah. you know i actually also have a piece of housekeeping which is a potato update um folks we've got roots and leaves um <laughs> you heard it here first we've got roots and leaves on the potato growing front if you have no idea what i'm talking about uh, there's an episode called growing potatoes number 183 check it out uh you'll get the rest of the story <laughs> you'll get it um jess is growing potatoes i think is got it. The- that's, that's the whole story okay fine <laughs> yeah we were trying um, to get a hook joey we're trying to get them you know if oh, we want to move more. up to <laughs> If you're interested in hybridization and (laughs) differing color potatoes and specifically tailoring a new potato to an occasion yet to be determined, if that excites you, boy, have we got an episode for you, Growing uh, growing Potatoes, episode 193. 83. 83? Yeah, 183. It's okay. Um, So, Liberian listeners, hello, thank you, welcome. Potato growers, hello, thank you, welcome. Um, we're going to talk about neither of those subjects for the rest of the show, I <laughs> think. Um, Jess, we're going to we're going to do an experiment today. We are. We both had topics that we were coming in around, loosely around the arena of comfort zones. So you're going to start in sort of more quotidian, everyday interactions with comfort zones. And then I'm going to go into abstractions and conceptual space as we are both want to do. But let's, let's see how this experiment goes. I, I have to say, I really like the original way you'd phrased it to me before we got on, which is, uh, you know, just your run-of-the-mill fabric of the universe comfort zone. <laughs> <laughs> just just these kind, kinds of questions spoiler yeah. we're gonna spoiler. talk about the oh, fabric sorry. of the universe sorry look we're no. just unhooking each other's hooks okay let's start with what you know i i'll just you know me i'm gonna start us smaller i'm gonna start us in this like very specific and particular space of something that came up over breakfast this morning for me uh in conversation I, w- I had cracked open uh, a cookbook of mine and was sort of flipping through. And I said out loud, you know, when, I, when I'm looking at a cookbook, I basically want every single recipe to have a photo attached to it because I want to know exactly what I'm getting myself into. And some of these recipes, like I can't imagine unless if I've not made it before, if I haven't eaten it from someone else, I, I want to, you know, I want to see what I'm going to be creating and then there's sort of that that beautiful before and after of like you know imagination versus real life side by side um 
But in the course of the conversation, we realized that there was sort of a um, dramatic, almost opposite, where when you're at a restaurant, like, I don't know if this is, I think, I feel like it's a negative stereotype that in like good restaurants don't put pictures in their menus. And it's such an interesting thought to me because there are some types of foods or places that I go where maybe I, maybe I have not ever tried XYZ dish before, but Mm -hmm. something else sounds more familiar. And even if there are no pictures, I'm like, well, I guess, you know, do I want to take a risk and go for something that I don't, I, I'm not even sure what it is, or do I go for the thing that's more familiar to me? And I think a lot of people might do that. And it's another thing that's been coming up in some conversations at home here around the idea of like the decision to explore versus enjoy. Like, do you choose to just do the thing, like get the thing, you know, you're going to like versus take a gamble and like, maybe it's not going to pan out for you. And I think that there's something really interesting to me about the idea. Well, first of all, the stereotype of photos not being, you know, like uh, whether it's like a, there's like some elitism wrapped up in like why you can't put a photo in a nice menu, but also like there's something about if you can imagine what that thing is, maybe it reduces some of the uncertainty about what you might be choosing. And in fact, encourage you to to explore, to, to choose something Mm -hmm. that surprises you. And so I guess, I don't know. I'm just really curious about this idea, you know, and, and what's so wrong with using pictures in menus. I think there is nothing wrong with it, although it is probably probably um, time and energy intensive in the nicer restaurants that would be changing their menu frequently. Mm-hmm. But even thinking about it, right, like if you're deciding to put a new thing on the menu and you have to show your like kitchen team how to make said new thing, then you're going to have like some experiments but it's also the quality of you know like food photography is its own arena and doing it in certain ways can make the food either look extremely appealing or unappealing so it it also then becomes like a question of uh, did you do did you do the dish justice so i can understand why it would be like extremely (laughs) intensive to be like here is our new here is our our new oyster with foam dish. I, that's that's me talking foodie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I even like another. You know, it, I, I guess this also applies to not just photographs, but in certain street food contexts where they'll like make sample food and show off that. But like, not everything looks as appetizing as after it's been sitting out there a while and also what a waste if it's really just for show but you mm-hmm. know yeah like how do you do justice to this thing to hopefully encourage people to not just order the same old same well the the thing that i was thinking about when you brought this up is this idea of experimenting or exploring is all sort of predicated on you making the choice in the moment of the food exploration, right? Like you have to choose the new thing that you want to try. And that can be a problem, particularly when you're exploring foods from other cultures, particularly other cultures that have, that speak another language, right? Like I'm thinking about looking at like a Vietnamese or a Thai or Chinese menu where you know, like, I don't know what pad CU is. The first time I had it was like a a product of like guessing based on some things on a menu where I'd never had Thai food before. And I was like, that seems kind of safe for my weird uh, food predilections. And I was like, oh, this is great. But, you know, pad CU maybe means like something that is very obvious in the translation of what it is like it could be like chicken and flat noodle i I don't know what that means but uh because you're required to make the choices yourself to explore when there's ambiguity it becomes difficult to explore what's interesting for me is i'm 
much less predisposed to choose the exploration route in food because of both allergies and weird texture issues and things like that. Mm -hmm. But if I go to a restaurant on like a special occasion that is like a prefix menu where it's like, I don't have any choice. You don't have choice. I always, yeah. I always wind up eating See? things that I never would have selected for myself off the menu. Yes. And most of the time enjoying them, you know, both probably because those places that have prefix menus are, you know, like fancier and they're, they're using better ingredients and, and whatever, but also like, you know, I would not pick some sort of like radish and squash soup as like a, a you wouldn't appetizer. have thought, and yet yeah. you're pleasantly surprised or delighted or something. You know, this is also something that I think is really, um, almost um, universal. This idea that like if something looks good, tastes good, smells good, all of those other things that might hold you back or preconceptions, the, the name of a dish, which like, you know, I it's been unfortunate. I think a lot of um, like digital recipe uh, purveyors have ended up like anglicizing certain names of dishes to be like, look, this is appealing. And then many people are like, what are you doing? That's just not what this, like, why are you coming up with a new name for a thing that is like, is a thing already? Like, what, what is that? Um, when really like, I, all of those things are distractions to me about like what should be a choice that's driven by this very like, I don't know, like this very primal gustatory instinct. Like wh why, why are we all like so caught up in, uh, you know, keeping things off of the page when in fact, like it feels like a very visceral decision or ideally maybe like you're saying like no decision at all. Um, I, I also, just as a sidebar, when you brought up this idea of the the role of choice, there was a minute where I thought you were going to say like, but actually it's destiny and it was fate that you like, you know, it, it wasn't, you actually had less choice than you think in whatever led you to this decision. And it reminded me of that uh, tense moment in The Devil Wears Prada where uh, Miranda Priestley, who is sort of like the uh, evil boss lady or at least like very impressive and powerful woman but like also like anti-hero anyway um, she is having a, a conversation with the um, the sort of assistant Andy Sachs who's like not known who doesn't know much about fashion and she's like I don't know like all these belts look the same to me blah 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 and Miranda Priestley just forgive me for reading this out loud is like <laughs> this stuff. Oh, okay. I'm not going to do any justice to the way that, um, uh, no, stop, stop, uh, stop anyway, filtering yourself. On. Just give okay, us Miranda. Okay, okay. She's like, I see. You think this has nothing to do with you. You go to your closet and you select, I don't know that lumpy blue sweater, for instance, because you're trying to tell the world that you take yourself too seriously to care about what you put on your back. But what you don't know is that that sweater is not just blue. It's not turquoise. It's not lapis. It's actually cerulean. You're also blithely unaware of the fact that in 2002, Oscar de la Renta did a collection of cerulean gowns. And then I think it was Yves Saint Laurent, wasn't it? Who showed cerulean military jackets. I think we need a jacket or jacket here and then cerulean quickly showed up in the collections of eight different designers then it filtered down through the department stores and trickled down into some tragic casual corner where you no doubt fished it out of some clearance bin however that <laughs> blue represents millions of dollars of countless jobs and it's sort of comical how you think that you've made a choice that exempts you from the fashion industry when in fact you're wearing a sweater that was selected for you by the people in this room from a pile of stuff the fate of your choice to avert all of those maybe scary tastes and textures and allergens was actually fated by all of the pressures to enjoy instead of explore in the restaurant. Fin. <laughs> I mean, uh, my, it was fated by my body's betrayal of my ability to explore the world. I, I, do, I do think there is a, a medium in between what you're talking about ultimately, though, right, where many menus you go to will say, 
you know, whatever, a bisque. And then it'll say like three ingredients or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. You know, like cream, bouillabaisse. I'm just throwing words (laughs) out. Bouillabaisse. (laughs) I don't even know what bouillabaisse is. Um, uh, Lobster. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, And, but... Right, the the actual experience of eating something is based in some different set of your senses, right? It is your it is gustatory, it is olfactory, so, so it I'm is saying. visual. Yes. But when you're it is so reductive to say like this is a lobster bisque. Yeah. The it makes me think about um wine in particular, because where I'm yes. going is like a, a photo what you're looking for is more information about either the thing that you're going to attempt to cook at home in a cookbook or on a menu item you're looking for more data to understand uh how to make the decision of what to pick or whether you cook something what is interesting is like if you talk about wine wine has slowly moved in the direction of at least attempting to describe whatever wine is in the particular bottle it has these flavor notes and this vintage yes it tastes like this instead of just being like it's you know pinot grigio (laughs) it's pinot noir it's cabernet Mm -hmm. 70 like there there's at least an attempt to go a little bit further and try and paint you some sort of sensory picture with words that many menus or uh, most menus that i'm experiencing don't do that totally i think i think that is actually that idea of painting a sensory picture is so much more the thing that is important over a photo or a sample food like presentation. It is, it's that of like stirring your imagination and like, I don't know, getting your taste buds excited for what is to come. And in fact, I think that's actually one place that I would say, you know, in, in maybe fine dining contexts where, they'll they'll paint that picture for you to me that's so much more appealing than more of just like an ingredients list to make sure that you know like then your mind is left up to sort of draw its own conclusions and right the the choice is a lot more uncomfortable to make from like an exploration side versus if you're painting that sensory picture then we're tapping into the things that are actually you know Th- those are the things that you're actually going to be putting through this taste experience. Yeah, and it also tells you like what the intention that someone was trying to accomplish was, right? Mm-hmm. Like thinking, you know, so there's a restaurant that me and my wife used to go to a lot for like anniversaries or birthdays called Contra in New York. And one of the one of the things I really liked that happened at, at Contra was they had a uh, the the chefs I think the head chef's name is Jonah. Um, there was like an orientation on mixing textures and like really balancing like sort of tensions. Of, like there's here's this crunchy thing against this really like soft thing, or here you know. Here's like a high fat flavor with a high acid flavor combined. And so you're like, even if you don't enjoy the dish, you can appreciate what they were trying to accomplish in in their attempt to describe why they made the thing the way they made it. And so in that way, it also becomes an opportunity to be social and understand what you're experimenting with, as opposed to just be like the Roman thumb. This was good. This was bad. This was good. Mm -hmm. This was bad. Um, So... Yeah, I I think it would be cool if restaurants were, you know, saying like, we made it this way. We, you know, even if you're like getting a sandwich, it's like we use this type of bread because it is chewier. So it holds up against the whatever, you know, again, I'm not a foodie, so I can't, I can't really get there with my own language. Yeah. And, and that like, I think also what I, I feel like you might be getting at too is that it doesn't have to be like the pretension of poetry necessarily like there are no. other you, it doesn't it doesn't need to be like and this is eliciting you know this very earthen 
it tastes like earthen pottery. You know, like it doesn't need to be that. It's okay. Like there are other ways I feel like to, to do this. And I am curious to see different variations, different attempts to like, I don't know, bring people in, entice them. But even knowing that like antici- anticipation for a yeah enjoyable experience is part of the enjoyment of the experience. So reading something like that and getting more excited by the menu item would potentially enhance the experience of actually eating it, both because you can understand what you're experiencing a little bit better and maybe be able to like atomize some of like the fle- the flavors and textures and and sort of combinations that you're experiencing, but also to be like, while you're waiting for the thing to arrive at your table, like try to anticipate what that experience is going to be like, could be like net positive to the overall experience. And balance sort of the, like how much information you reveal at what time. Like if you Mm. don't do enough of a job of painting that picture, like if you don't, you know, give those hints, then maybe you're not going to entice people to make this choice. But also if you reveal too much, if you show what exactly it looks like they're going to get, you don't, you sort of like snub any of that anticipation at all. So it's like, how do you balance this? Uh, Anyway, you're going to ask me to wrap this up. I was going to say, do you want to bring us to your menu corner? Yeah, I think that what started with sort of this interesting um and obvious lack like why why is it that um you know you might not see photos of food in a restaurant uh and how does that affect people's comfort and willingness to explore and try new things versus staying in their comfort zones and it's i think what we're getting to is it's not even so much about the you know giving people exactly a clear depiction of what they're going to get maybe that's more relevant for a cookbook instead it is more interesting to paint a kind of sensory picture create anticipation of a pleasant experience but also make sure that that choice is made to encourage people to explore more than they might have how do you sort of bring them in bring people in to get them excited about whatever is to come and maybe be surprised. Try something new. Or just remove the choice altogether. Just like make people eat stuff. There's yeah, that. That's it. Words of advice. <laughs> Unclear, undirected words of advice. Part two. Part de. The second half. That's that's after the colon. Oh, Part okay. two. The part second, two, the half. second half. Yeah, got it. Yeah, um, <laughs> the second half of part two. So actually, it's like, <laughs> got it. Part two point five. Oh, uh, the so. Speaking of comfort zones and okay. moving from, uh, the gustatory to the conceptual, I have I've been um taking in a number of stimuli, intellectual stimuli, as I am want to do. Jess, sure. I'm trying not to say I read an article or something. It's okay. I, I say it if it's true. Did I, you read an article? I, no, not in this case, no. It, <laughs> Did you I read started, a <laughs> I, I started re- watching a miniseries about a book by Michael Pollan, How to Change Your Mind. It is a, a four-part miniseries in the Michael Pollan vein of Botany of Desire also being a four-part series. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it covers LSD, um, uh, mycelium, uh, you know, magic mushrooms, um, uh, NDMA, and DMT, I believe, are like the four chapters and just sort of exploring like the science and knowledge around those areas you don't know why does MDMA it all have to be is, letters like what if they got cool names that weren't letters? because i mean they they all do have like street names right like uh lsd is acid people call it lucy or things like that so uh that's too many names nicknames lucy in the sky with lucy in the sky with diamonds the beatles song 
Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds LSD is wow. like what an education uh, this is. Mushrooms may be called boomers. MDMA is called Molly or ecstasy. Uh, DMT. I don't know. DMT. I usually just hear called DMT, <laughs> although oh. it exists in many things like peyote and uh, the the toad venom or I believe DMT is also the key component in ayahuasca. Uh, anyways, I, I was going through that series and there's a lot of exploration around this idea of consciousness and um, sort of the expansion of consciousness and the idea that a lot of people are sort of experiencing something that feels bigger or beyond themselves or a connection to some sort of universal consciousness within these experiences, you know, there, there is similar to food, an attempt to explain through language an experience that is not inherently <laughs> language based. And yeah. so people wind up landing on sort of like similar valence of language around the experience of consciousness or being awake or becoming aware of things that they weren't otherwise yeah. aware of etc. Um, I also in, in, and this, is, that is like an idea that has been interesting to me for a while. There was a quantum physicist who had, uh, explored this idea of quantum consciousness and starting to feel as though he was seeing, um, something emerge as he was getting, he, he was one of the, the early leaders in, um uh like literally wrote the textbook on <laughs> the grad students like the first textbook they get on like subatomic particles and quantum mechanics and things like that and i also encountered an interview with a a gentleman named uh donald hoffman who's a cognitive uh scientist who's exploring consciousness and trying to explore consciousness in mathematical terms. And in that conversation, he spoke about this emerging idea within physics, which I have since then read a bunch of journal, sure. you know, attempted, attempted to read journal yeah. articles about some of these ideas, um, about, uh, an increasing orientation within some of the cutting edge experiments and theoretical ideas in physics that space time is no longer the sort of foundational aspect of the universe potentially that we thought it was. And I don't have to, <laughs> I don't have to go down the, the whole of some of those things because I would do a shitty job explaining that, amplitudehedron or some of these other ideas but what has been really exciting to me and it has has maybe given me a little insight into myself in the same way that I was very excited by this like grabby alien theory that we spoke about a few weeks ago is I really love the discomfort of encountering a new theory that attempts to break everything <laughs> but like this idea some of the things that are coming out of some of these princeton uh theoretical physicists are basically saying like if space-time isn't foundational it explains why gravity can't be brought down to the quantum level because it may exist in extra dimensions and space-time only exists in four dimensions and things like the amplitudehedron are explaining phenomena that we're experiencing today in like the Large Hadron Collider uh, in like one line expressions as opposed to million line expressions that it takes when you're only operating in four dimensions with like a Feynman tree or something like that. And I'm like, I'm just so delighted by the idea that like my conception is broken and what are the possibilities of these new things? And so I wanted to talk to you about how you feel about exploring new ideas that break your concept of reality. <laughs> wow, we could spend so much 
longer talking about this. I wish we had more time. But I think actually having the conversation about menus is actually a really interesting way to think about this for me because personally, what you're describing is like an inevitability that there is so much that we do not know. There is more that we don't know than we do know, even if it feels like we know so many things. Like, how could we, right? Like, the I, there is going, there are going to be things that are discovered that are unavoidable, things that you do not choose, but force us to explore and open our minds to like a new way of understanding our world and like how things work and why things are the way they are. However, that versus the kind of to use uh, you know the word that you brought up in our show the other week this idea of like a view quake that versus choosing to create a michael pollan style life changing experience that cannot be described in words that's the thing that's like i don't know and i think it's because of how one feels out of my control. I am taking the pre-fee menu of science and life where it's like, it's happening to me and I will taste <laughs> yeah. your radish soup, you know? Versus... Yeah. Fine, ver I will explore the amplitudehedron. <laughs> yeah, versus like, are you... Like, I'm the picky eater of scientific discoveries. I'm like, I want to know. I also am acutely aware of how human I am in like the discomfort of that change and I will ex I, I understand and appreciate that's how progress happens but I also um, unless it's happening to me it is like it, I don't know and this is where I'm like I know I'm just like how I'm not I'm certainly not special in this way I think like this is probably a predominant way of being for many people which is just like recognize this is uncomfortable and then there are some things that you must embrace even if you don't like it like climate change like there are things that are it's just happening to you so just like eat the soup and like it's gonna it's gonna be horrible <laughs> and scary and just like move on you know i, I think yeah. that's why I, I don't know that maybe that's like a crazy pessimistic way about no, it of, I, like i i don't choose to take like the psycho um why am i blanking on the word psychoactive yeah right like the... i don't choose that because it is within my it is in in my choice house i can choose not to do that but i cannot <laughs> choose to house. avoid but I, <laughs> but I cannot choose to avoid climate change you know what i mean no i love this i love this analogy to the food right because i am a picky eater and i have this sort of i, I i'm a picky eater on top of having restrictions which makes me a double it's e like, doubly picky difficult I, and i have definitely put in the work to expand my palate and all of those things but it is a difficult thing and left to my own devices i will just choose the thing i know and like as it relates to food but it, in the flip side i am like the whatever you know uh david the voracious or, or, <laughs> yeah, scientific like, article I Consumer? I will like jump into a new field and be like, what are you guys talking about? Let me Ooh, try that and just like start yeah. shoving stuff in my mouth and being like, oh, like, that wasn't like yours. That. <laughs> it's like, yeah. that was on my plate. What are you doing, man? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it is like the, you know, we, we sometimes talk about, and maybe we've spoken about it on the show, but I just love the idea of expanded possibilities and the ability to explain things that we didn't have answers to in new ways and for me the discomfort that comes through in this arena is attempting you know in some ways i i said before the show like i know or i assume anyways that these people are smarter than me however however positively i might think about my own intellect like they're further <laughs> right like they're they're doing more they're doing better they're like pushing uh the boundaries but the experience of like trying to come to the edge of my ability to comprehend these difficult concepts and then just mm -hmm. like playing with them in my head yeah. right like 
and just swirling them around, like to some of these other conversations that we've had, right? The, this idea that is coming out of Donald Hoffman's theories, as well as mixing with some of these theoretical physicists, is like the idea that consciousness may be sort of fundamental to the universe as opposed to space time, that consciousness itself creates space time as opposed to space time creating consciousness. There was like actually new scientists had a whole issue of the magazine around some of these new ideas of consciousness emerging. And so all of a sudden, because it's forcing you to like look at the problem in different ways, like I was riding my bike and being like, well, there's all of these UAPs or UFOs that the military is seeing along the eastern seaboard. But if consciousness is uh, sort of the emergent property that creates space time, what if pods of whales are actually creating those things because they are also conscious and have yes. these massive brains and are interacting whales. in different ways and they're finding ways to use consciousness to manipulate the environment i'm like i don't there's literally that is like just pure creative speculation but i was like that's fun as like a wow. possibility creative uh, speculation yeah uh, and so you know the, those ideas or you know there's this idea of like nicholas bostrom and his sort of emerging culture of like simulation theory like what if we're all just living in a simulation which i always sort of had an allergic reaction to it just feels like nihilistic to me but <laughs> the flip side of this is like in donald hoffman's theory is that what if we just what if your body and your perception and your experience is just like a, a ui like a user interface for inter interacting with like the data infrastructure of the universe and it's not like showing you reality. It's just showing you a way to like exist in your sort of portion of reality that we exist in. And that, that's so much more appealing in, in saying like <laughs> our perception isn't real, but in a way that is more appetizing, I guess, like two chefs presenting vaguely similar ideas, but I like the way that this chef is cooking it better, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah. I don't know. Is there a way in which, so for you, like the prefix menu version of this is like going to school maybe, right? It's like yeah, you go to a class, they tell you what they're going to tell you and you sort of absorb those things and maybe can well, enjoy it. And I think this is that of like going about life as a student. I think it doesn't mean that all things that you hear are like, that's it. So you just like take exactly what you hear and that's the whole thing. It's instead the idea that like, can you balance these multiple ideas at the same time? And like, even if that makes you really like that may be exciting to you and may be uncomfortable to me, but at least like, can it be done? Uh, can you like conceive that there is another way to look at things, right? A different way of framing them. I'm sure you could probably look for one that is more appealing than another. Um, you know, it almost made me, it made me think like, the good version of this reminded me of the spelling bee toggle, which is a New York Times <laughs> game where you're trying to combine all sorts of letters in a different way, but you have to use the center letter. And if you use the app, uh, the letters on the periphery, you can press this little remix button and it'll shift the locations of the letters on the outside. And even though like it's not changing the, the letters are still the exact same letters. It's just rearranging them in a different place. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, uh, and you think of new letters because just like the rearrangement of those things is something that is useful. And that to me is like the kind of toggle, a, a kind of source of possibility that comes from like a different framing that is really great. I think for a lot of people, what's really scary is if you click that button and you don't know what happens. Like, oh no, what if it erases everything? Like the dread that yeah. said, like on one channel, there's creative speculation and on the other channel, there's existential dread. And it's really yeah. scary if you do not know the implications of those things. And, and it is a tar like, and if it's in your control, if you don't have to press that button and you don't know what it does, like maybe you withhold. But if it's happening for you every five minutes and the button is pressed, it's like, all right, now I have to, now I'm, now I'm like experiencing this new frame. 
And so here we are. In fact, you know what it's like? I learned from that first episode of watching that show about how to change your mind. Like the, the person who discovered LSD did so by accident. And it was a chemist who just like <laughs> accidentally took some and was like, whoa, all right, something is up. And then took it again because he's a chemist. And so I just think like. And took that, a God it, dose of it. Yeah, it's really yeah. not great. Um, but I think that like, it's that right. It's where, uh, how much agency do you have and therefore like how much can you eliminate the sort of mm-hmm. this, the risk of the, like the, the negative type of possibility where someone doesn't have to fester on it. What's like the opposite yeah. of good anticipation, bad foreboding. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. The, like, I'm going to explore my comfort zone, but I might break everything. Yeah. Like, uh oh. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'm like talking to my parents yesterday with Emerson and like talking to them about, I'm like, so here's what the amplitude hedron is and what we're talking about Got is it. extra dimensional sure. space yeah. and conscious. And they're like, Go, great. Anyways, can you like turn the camera at our kid again, at your kid yeah. again so she can sing? Uh, I, we don't really care about this. And I'm like, oh my God, have you heard about you no idea. consciousness may be fundamental to the universe? <laughs> uh, well, Jess, um, do you want to, do you want to bring us to Jess's discomfort corner? Oh my God. I love that so much. Um, this idea of, you know, questioning our world and how we think of it. Some of it is just going to happen. Like, whether you like it or not, other people are asking these questions, even if you aren't. And I think where, I don't know, I think we all could stand to take a lesson out of your book, Joey, and try to get more excited about what happens when you press that toggle. Like, what happens when you look at it? It's not the easiest thing. Certainly for me, it is not. But if you're an explorer type, I don't know. I feel like that's where cool things come from. It's where cool things come from. Get uncomfortable. <laughs> Get un. Except, like, can I just like opt out of some of them? It's so hard. Can I just have like uh, a like a pillow? <laughs> just have a pillow while it's happening. Yes. Yeah, well, come. An existential pillow. Just soothe me as it. <laughs> soothe me on the way down. It's just too difficult. Oh my. Can goodness. I get like a butt donut? Uh, <laughs> what? That's just an inner tube. <laughs> like the the seats to make your butt comfortable. I don't know what. <gasps> Have you actually, sat on those? They are, they are amazing. I uh, have My friend has. Just get an existential one. one. Well, <laughs> cushioning well, is great. We did it. We did it. Critical nonsense is a Sylvain production. Brought to you by uncomfortable radishes. Take a bite. You'll never know what could happen next. Uh, We'd like to thank our executive producer and existential butt pillow, Jess Vander. Thank you. (laughs) Special thanks. No, regular thanks and special thanks (laughs) to our sound engineer and uh, being we always would choose to have around Alex Contel. Welcome back. We'd like to thank our programming manager and seat of consciousness, Les Jacobs. And thanks to our production crew and uh, sensory painters, Sarah Gilbert and Nora Mestridge. As always, thank you, Sari, Elen, and happy birthday, because maybe by the time this comes out, it will have already been your birthday. So happy birthday. <gasps> happy almost birthday. But also sorry. Yeah. Special thanks, scientists out here just thinking about stuff real True. hard. Yes, plus one. Thank to, you for looking at to, things that are too scary for me to think about, but I really do appreciate you. Thank you thanks. for for getting me to think about whale consciousness on my bike yeah. ride, scientists. Thanks to um, the on-screen chemistry between Meryl Streep and Anne Hathaway for changing my life and convincing me to move to New York City. Maybe they had quantum consciousness entanglement when they were filming it. And that's why. (laughs) Thanks Thanks. for cooperation. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for just like, you know, finding beautiful things in the world. 
thanks for the freedom of choices and also other things making positive choices for us like a pre menu if you have the opportunity <laughs> i would highly recommend it what an idea what an ideal situation thanks jonah at contra for making mm. me eat things i would never eat yeah. you did it <laughs> Thanks exploring. And thanks enjoying. <laughs> and thanks to Alanis Morissette for the song Thank You. Maybe. Yeah. No. Thanks. Uh, well, we well, did it. All right. Okay. Love you. Okay. Bye. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Recording. 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 Recording in progress.